Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Roll Deep Dive webinar. Glad to have you here. Today, we're going to be covering Classification Manager, a great, exciting new role. We're going to dive into all the capabilities. But before we do, I just want to point out to you that uh, we'll be accepting all your questions today in the user community. So if you're on YouTube right now, look in the description box below and you'll find a link to this post in the user community. This gives you more details, including links to uh, speaker information, as well as opportunities to sign up for the newsletter and see replays of all of our past webinars, all great material. And finally, you can ask your questions here in the comments section below. And what we're gonna do at the end of the webinar, we're gonna to respond to your questions live. So uh, this is the place to go. You can't ask your questions in YouTube. You have to ask them here in the community, which is your ultimate source for all things Inovia. Now, uh, without any more dawdling, I'm gonna turn it over to Naeem to introduce uh, his team and the webinar. Hi, Naeem. everyone. Uh, this is Naeem. Uh, I'm the Inovia Technical Portfolio uh, Team Manager. And today with Anat, we are going to uh, go into a deep dive of the functionality of uh, Classification Manager role of Inovia, or uh, what we call as well uh, CCM role. Um, so we're going to go through uh, an overview, describe the role, and later on, Anat is going to take the lead and will uh, present uh, a deep dive functionality of the role going through different steps uh, to show how this role works, what are the benefits of uh, these phases of the role. And at the end, uh, she will go through uh, latest uh, features and enhancement that have been introduced in the latest releases. And finally, we will uh, answer the questions, as uh, Matthew mentioned, that you will be uh, writing them into the community so we can exchange with you on these questions not just now but also further later on if you don't have the time now you can ask your questions later on in the same community so let's start by introducing this role and before going into the role let's understand what are the challenges or the business challenges this role is trying to solve so as you know uh, products are getting more and more complex there's a big complexity of the product and the product development. We need to speed up the product development. We need to be able to answer all the customer needs. And one of the things is the ability to uh, uh, find and classify the product IP in a very easy way, in a very secured way, so people can find their content in a very easy way and in a very uh, efficient way. Once I find my IP, I need also to uh, share it with other users, but I need to make sure that I am finding and I'm sharing the right IP. So all of this uh, is a, all these set of uh, business challenges require some kind of a solution in order to be able to uh, address these topics which are around the product IP classification. Okay, next. Okay, so uh, to introduce this role, let's first understand, as you know, uh, the Novia or the Fleet Experience Platform has uh, different layers of uh, roles. So we start here with the business uh, innovator role, which digitally connects everyone in the organization. On top of that, we have the industry innovator role, which allows you to collaborate between uh, across different uh, discipline through the development and the innovation process. And on top of that role, here we have specific roles which are dedicated to uh, specific users uh, who are working in uh, specific domains. One of them is the classification manager. So the, as you can see here, the classification manager has a prerequisite of a collaborative industry innovator uh, role. Now let's see uh, what is the content of this role. So basically this role allows you to classify the IP that is introduced in the enterprise. It allows you to quickly identify, navigate, and reuse this IP whenever it is needed. So it's really, it's the basic of uh, definition of your IP, which will give um, 
let's say, benefits, not just for the person himself, but also for everyone in the organization who needs to find and reuse the IP that has been defined by the uh, different users in the organization. So it improves the whole process, and by that, it reduces, of, co of course, the development costs, and it gives you a very secured way to uh, classify and to find and to retrieve your IP. Okay, thank you, Naim, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Anat, and uh, as Naim mentioned, I'm going to uh, going, I'm going to walk you through the um, application itself. Um, we'll uh, view the technical part of the classification manager role, including the description of the different functions, and we will do also some demos. And at the end, I hope we will have time so uh, for some uh, new, interesting, um, latest enhancements. So uh, let's get started. As uh, Naim mentioned, the uh, classification manager role uh, sits on top of collaborative business innovator and collaborative industry innovator. And it brings uh, two main applications, the IP classification and the IP classification editor. Um, both of them are used to, to manage and define the classification taxonomy. Uh, IP classification is the uh, legacy traditional web application, uh, while the IP classification editor, this is the DS strategy um, to manage classification, and this is a dashboard application. Uh, we are still using the IP classification um, mainly to create and manage classification attributes because this, uh, this capability um, does not exist yet in the uh, dashboard application. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Collaborative Industry Innovator role uh, also contains one relevant application uh, called IP Classify and Reuse. Uh, this is also a dashboard application um, that um, users having, uh, having the Collaborative Industry Innovator role can classify and declassify IP in the classification, as, uh, as well as um, search and then uh, reuse the classified IP. So um, when we are talking about classification, we break it down into um, three key processes. Uh, the first one is to create a classification taxonomy. This is usually done by the librarian and for, for this, uh, the librarian would need to have the classification manager role uh, with the IP classification and the IP classification editor application. Then, um, this also can be done by librarian, but in many, uh, in many companies, um, this is done by um, uh, component managers. Uh, they start to classify um, their IP, to classify the, uh, the different components. Uh, and for this, you don't need anymore to have the classification manager role, but um, you are using the IP classify and reuse application, which is part of collaborative industry innovator. And the third process would be for every user within the organization um, to start and leverage the investment done by the librarian and by the component manager and to search and reuse to maximize reuse of, uh, of the uh, classified component. So this is also the way I'm going to organize uh, the, um, the webinar. We'll go through the different processes and we also see some examples. How does that look in the system? So um, let's get started. Um, so as mentioned, the first, uh, the first uh, step would be to create a classification taxonomy. What does it mean? Um, librarian will create the library structure, including classes and subclasses, uh, and also uh, creates the classification attributes and assign the classification attributes to the different classes in the, in the structure. Uh, and then uh, we need to activate all new libraries and classes uh, to publish them for others, to make them available for others. So first, uh, the top level um, node is um, we are using libraries. And below a library, we uh, define um, classes as well as subclasses, uh, which are also containers. Um, you may have as many uh, subclasses and classes as you wish. 
And as you can um, see here, we are using um, libraries and classes of type general. And uh, to create this uh, library structure, you have two options. One is to create it manually within the application itself. And the other option is to import it based on an XML file. Um, for example, um, you can set this structure in a development system, and then you want to transfer it into the production system. So you can export it from the uh, um, development system and import it into the uh, production system. Now let's talk about classification uh, attributes. Uh, what are classification attributes? So classification attributes are, in general, regular global attributes um, in the 3D experience platform. Uh, but they are created in the IP classification application. And therefore, they are tagged as classification attributes. Uh, we associate the, the attributes to one or more classes. As you can see here in this example, uh, attribute one, two, and three are associated to class one. But attribute two is also associated to class two. And that, that's okay. Um, and by associating the attributes to the class, you actually give kind of a definition uh, to the class. Now, once we associate the classification attributes to the class, um, um, the attributes are in inherited into all subclasses, as you can see here in this example. And then I can add some additional unique attribute, for example, attribute five, to the subclass if I want to extend uh, it's, uh, its definition. Um, just as a reminder, um, the classification attributes are created, should be created in the IP classification application, which is available from the um, legacy traditional um, user interface. Um, what you see here is the uh, dialogue to create a new classification attribute. Um, it's pretty much similar if you if you are aware same same process as you create a new attribute in 3D experience platform not necessarily a classification attribute um, so you define the name of the attribute the display name we support a different type of attributes for example string date boolean integer and real um, if you, uh, if you create an attribute of type real, you can set the dimension for it, the unit. For example, I am a length. And then um, you can also, this is optional, you can also define um, the display unit. Um, for example, um, centimeter for, for length. And uh, this display unit is fixed everywhere in the web application, in the native applications. Um, but uh, if, you, uh, if you prefer to keep it empty, then the dimension DA will be displayed using MKS unit system. MKS stands for uh, meter, kilo, and um, seconds. And then, um, if you know, in the native application, you can go to the meet references and uh, set there the display unit for, for the dimension. But be aware, it's a little bit uh, different. There, you define it for dimension across all attributes that are using this dimension. Here, if you set the display unit, it will be for this particular attribute. Um, then, if the uh, attribute is multi-valued, so we select true, otherwise leave the, the default uh, as false. Uh, there is also an option um, to um, to display the attribute in 6W tags. For this, we are using um, the predicate. Uh, this, this field is, is used to expose the attribute in 6W tag. Again, it's relevant only for attributes of type string and Boolean. And um, be noted that um, 3D experience comes with a list of out of the box um, predicates but uh, we don't recommend to use them. We recommend to create a, a unique predicate for a new attribute. And to do that, there is a, a process for that. You need to import a vocabulary file, also called RDF. It's not part of our webinar, but it's, it is well documented in, um, 
in this official documentation. Um, we set the description. Uh, we can set the, the default value for this attribute. And also, um, if the attribute is of type string, integer, or real, we can set the authorized values. So then when you come and set the value, we'll get a list of values that you can choose from. Uh, minimum and maximum values, um, if you want to define uh, the range uh, of, of the attributes. Um, then after creating the, uh, the attributes, um, you don't need to do that after each attribute, you, you create your set of attributes and then it is important that admin uh, will uh, update the index model uh, in order to make the attributes available for the indexation process. And then uh, any users actually can use those attributes to search and filter classified items based on those classification attributes. It's uh, also recommended to um, um, reload the cache in order to make the display name effective. And uh, I'll show you, but uh, this is done in, uh, by admin in the platform manager role. You go to collaborative space configuration center widget and you open the configuration deployment dialog and you click here to update the index model. Um, then it's important, all, li all new libraries and new classes are created by default in uh, inactive state, which is similar to private state. Um, and it, it means that it's not available for all. And uh, you need to promote them into an active state, which is similar to in work state, in order to publish them and to make them um, available for, for all users. Uh, there is also an obsolete state in case you don't no longer need the class to use the class or the library you can promote it into an obsolete state so let's uh, let's uh, see how does that look in the system the first part of creating the classification taxonomy so um, as mentioned i will use the ip classification editor uh, application so I will add it to my uh, dashboard I'll change the, uh, the tab name and uh, I'll change the preferences this is something I'm, I'm going to do only for the demo purposes because I will uncheck the use index because everything that I'm creating now, li new libraries, new classes, I want it to be uh, displayed in the, in the user interface immediately. So I started with creating a new library. And you will see that there are multiple ways to create new uh, libraries and new classes. One way is from the toolbar, as I'm doing now. So I'll create another uh, library. And you can note that once I'm creating a new library, the title is get uh, immediately into an edit mode. It makes it very easy to, um, to set the title just after creation. Um, now I can, below the, the library, I can start to create my, uh, my library structure, including classes and subclasses. Um, so I created <coughs> a main <coughs> class valves and I will create um, a subclass below that. So I can create it either from the landing page if, it is, uh, if this class is empty or from, as you can see here, from the toolbar itself. Uh, or there is also uh, an ability to create a new class either by right click on the right side, which calls the um, content panel or also from the left side, the navigation panel. So I created here a few subclasses and now I can open the class properties in order to edit and add the uh, class description. Let's expand uh, my structure and I'll do a little bit fast forward so we will have much more classes and subclasses here. Uh, 
At any point of time, I can uh, decide to delete a class, but the system will check that I have the right privileges and also that the class is empty, doesn't contain any subclasses or doesn't have, it doesn't have any, uh, any classified items before I'm deleting it. I can also add a class or a subclass to my favorite, which makes it very easy when I have a long list of classes and, uh, and uh, sophisticated structure, I can um, access a subclass um, very easily. Now, um, so we created our library structure. Now I'm going to create the classification attributes. For that, I'm using the IP classification uh, web application. Um, first, uh, all the classification attributes need to be um, a, under a kind of a collection, a group of, a, we call it attribute group. Uh, it's not visible in the UI, but we need to collect them under this, uh, this group. So I'm cre I created one group for that. And now let's create the first attribute. Uh, the first attribute would be um, a type of operation and it will be a string attribute. I will select a predicate for, for it. Uh, we will use it later on when we, when we will search for, for the at items. And I will also have a default value and authorized values for this uh, attribute. So when I um, select the value for this attribute, I will get a list of values that I can choose from. Let's just for the uh, uh, example, let's create another one. Uh, this time it will be an attribute of type uh, real. So I can also select the dimension. This is a minimum temperature, so the dimension will be temperature. And I'll also select the display unit to be Celsius degrees. Let's add the description. Uh, a default value uh, would be zero. And that's it for now. So we created two classification attributes. Uh, and uh, if I already have in the system uh, classification, predefined classification attributes, I can add them to my, uh, to my group in order to use them and associate them to the class. So I'm searching for additional classification attributes and, um, and add them to my group in order to use them. So, so far, we created the library structure, we created the classification attributes, and now I'm going to associate the classification attributes into the class. So here I'm standing on the Valves class, and I'm selecting to, um, to associate five attributes to the Valves class to define this, uh, this class. I'm doing it uh, from the um, content panel. I'm just switching to, um, to classification attributes tab. Now you can note that those attributes are inherited to any subclass uh, below the valves class. And now I can add additional attributes because I want to add some additional definition to the ball valve class. So I'm adding another six um, attributes. So five of them uh, are inherited from the um, top level and uh, one attribute is, uh, is set for this specific class. Last but not least, I will uh, activate the, uh, the class. So I'll promote the class to active in order for, to be, to, for, in order for the class to be available for others. And as mentioned, I'm logged in as administrator. I'm using the Collaborative Space Control Center application, uh, the Collaborative Space Configuration Center widget, um, to be precise, in order to, um, to index the uh, newly created attributes. Uh, let's open the configuration deployment panel. And from here, I can uh, run the update index model. as well as the um, reload cache. OK, 
Okay, so uh, in the first uh, process, we created the, the classification taxonomy, including the, the um, structure, the, um, uh, the classification attributes. We associate the classification attributes to, to the classes. And um, now um, let's, uh, let's start uh, with the second process, which is to classify the IP. So as you probably already understood, Libraries allow you to organize assets into a structured, uh, into a structure. Uh, actually, much much as you can do with bookmark editor, but uh, libraries allows you um, to do more because libraries offer the additional capability to associate um, the class attributes to the data that is organized uh, under um, each specific class. And then the user can set the uh, values for the attributes for, for those um, classified um, assets. And uh, this will be done um, using the IP classify and reuse uh, widget application. So uh, what, uh, what type of objects can we classify in, uh, in libraries? So as, as of today, um, we can classify the majority of the 3D experience uh, platform objects, object types. Here you can see a very, very short list, just as an example, but we have hundreds of uh, object types that can be classified. So if we go, if we look at the list here, just the examples, we can classify engineering items. I assume this is one of the most um, common uh, item companies are classifying. Uh, documents, if you, for example, uh, work, you have uh, standards, uh, procedures, uh, it makes sense to classify them. Uh, projects and tasks, issues, uh, requirements can also be classified. Uh, resources um, to be used in Delmia, uh, material that you use in, in Simulia, and uh, also engineering templates and component families uh, defined in CATIA. So, um, 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 then you actually um, place a, a, an item under the, uh, the class, and, um, and by that, uh, the, the item acquires the attributes from that uh, particular class. Um, for example, if I take um, an item and I place it under uh, a screw class, this item becomes a screw. And uh, if this class has um, uh, the attributes of uh, the screw length and the screw um, head type, so I can define the relevant values for this particular item. Um, so the, uh, the classification attributes that are associated to the class are inherited to the classified items. Um, and you understand that by doing that, uh, we uh, admin doesn't need to go and extend the data model and to add additional subtypes um, um, into the data model. Um, just by placing the item into the class, um, you extend the definition of this item. And if you need um, more attributes to, to define this item, you can place it in, in another class. So this is the, the concept also of uh, multiple classification, uh, which uh, 3D experience allows us to, to do. It allows us to organize the same content uh, from the perspective of different uses and different disciplines. So um, the basic concept is that we create a unique taxonomy in different libraries that apply to the same, uh, the same item. So uh, the taxonomy of those, uh, of those libraries um, is structured in a way that is familiar to the role of the person using them. For example, a, an engineer and a market, marketing person may think in entirely different ways of organizing assets. Engineer looks uh, on technical parameters, uh, while marketing looks on other parameters, for example, region or shelf life. Uh, but the same item, as you can see here, is classified in both libraries 
and therefore have both attributes, the technical ones and the marketing ones. Uh, and this makes uh, it very, very easy for each user um, to find and use the data from their own context while accessing the same data from this a single common uh, database. So as explained, um, when an item is placed under a class, it inherits uh, the attributes from that class. And then the attributes are dynamically displayed in the uh, properties of the classified item, as you can see here. And those are the attributes coming from the class. And the attributes are organized and grouped um, uh, by the classes the attributes are associated with. And then if you have the right privileges, you can go into an edit mode and you can enter um, values um, to the attributes because the classified item doesn't automatically acquire any values for those attributes unless there is a default value. Uh, but uh, then in the uh, properties, you can set the, the different values for, for each uh, classified item. So let's, uh, let's see again, how does that look in the system? So here, uh, let's say uh, I'm opening a new tab and I will um, add to my dashboard the IP classify and reuse application in order to start classifying IP. You will note that um, the, uh, it, it looks pretty much the same as the IP classification editor, quite the same look and feel. We have, um, we have the toolbar, we have on the left side the, uh, the library structure, and on the right side we have the uh, content panel, but with a different, different content. This time we will use it in order to add uh, items into the class. So I'm standing on the ball class and I'm searching, same as I'm doing a global search for items in the database. I can multi-select and add them um, into the uh, ball class. So I added six items that are now classified in the ball class. Um, I will just use this option in order to add um, the possibility to have the thumbnail um, displayed in the table. And now I can open, for example, the properties of the one of the items in order to look at the classified items and uh, classified the classification attributes and uh, edit them. So you can see I have um, my, my classification attributes and I can start adding um, relevant values. So uh, the classification attributes are also available and displayed uh, automatically in the, in the table here. And uh, as you saw, I can classify item. I can also declassify item. I can decide to remove um, one item from my class. I just will do a right click, remove content. This is also possible. We'll do a refresh. And we have our classification structure with few classified items. And that uh, brings us to the um, third process, the third uh, step about search and reuse. This is where um, actually um, we will going to understand how users can benefit from all the work done by the uh, librarian. Uh, so once the items are classified and the attribute values are set, a user can uh, navigate through the library structure and uh, search and find the classified content in order to, to do reuse. And this is also, it's, uh, it's available uh, with the IP classify and reuse application, which is part of the uh, collaborative industry in Vatorol. 
and available pretty much to, to all users. Um, so uh, one way to, um, to look on the classified items is just by navigating through the library taxonomy with a graphical tree-based browser, as you can see here. Um, all the classified items for the selected level on the left side are displayed along with uh, the relevant classification attributes. But of course, this list can be very, very, very long. And uh, therefore, we are allowed to, to um, narrow down the list and to do some search in order to, um, to search for classified items based on the classification attributes. To do that, um, you would need to um, type manually the search syntax uh, in the search within field uh, available in the toolbar of the IP classifier and reuse. And uh, here in the table, you can see uh, just a um, few um, examples of, uh, of the search index. Um, it, it, if you note, it, um, the, it looks pretty much the same. It always will be um, the uh, classification attribute name, for example, actual cost. Then you will have the query operator, for example, equal. And then the value to query, 65. And uh, if you want, you can also uh, add uh, units, for example, test length, uh, bigger or equal to 55 yard. And you can know that uh, we have a space between the unit and the, between the value and the unit, and therefore we need to use double quotes. Um, actually, you can search with different uh, units and the system automatically converts entered um, um, search criteria values to the units stored in the database. Um, similar to, um, to global search, you can also use um, and and or logical expressions and asterisk and, uh, and question mark. Um, and then, so we can search and we can narrow um, um, the, the list and uh, we can even go further and use the 6W tags in order to, to filter um, the search result, either if we are doing a global search or search within. For example, here I did a global search. I searched for all schools. I found 162 results. And you can note that in the 6W tag, I have out of the box by default, I have um, the list of libraries and the list of classes. Um, so you can see that um, if uh, out of the 162 results, um, three schools are classified under the mechanical components library. And I can, um, I can click here and filter the list to show me only those Three components. Um, here we have an example of, uh, of a predicate um, that actually exposes the uh, one of the classification attributes in the 6W tag. In this example, we, if you remember, we took, uh, uh, in this example, it's, it's different, we'll see it in the demo, but here uh, we, um, we define the, as a predicate the um, school um, head type. And if I'm clicking on the blue area, I will get only the screws with a round head type. Um, so, okay. And this is, this is really, really nice uh, capability. Everything that I explained about um, navigate through the uh, structure, search for classified items, it's also available to you in, um, directly in the CAD environment. Uh, so, for example, in native app, we have what we call library browser. Uh, it's available under the tools uh, menu. And you will get um, a, um, a window, uh, we call it library browser, with quite the same look and feel and similarity experience as the IP classifier and reuse. You can navigate through the um, library structure, you can search within. You can open the properties and see the um, classification attributes. And then you can um, use it into your session. 
A similar capability also exists in SOLIDWORKS and in um, CATIA V5. So let's, um, let's uh, look on the demo now. Um, first, before I start, um, um, you can see that I'm using here, I'm using a notepad with a few queries that I wrote in advance. Uh, it will be easier because you, you can see the, um, the syntax and I will be able also to copy paste it into the search within instead of typing it uh, each time. So I'm standing here on the ball class and you can see that I have uh, the five classified uh, valves that we classified in the ball with their um, classification attributes. And the first query would be to um, search for all valves um, made of carbon steel. You can see I'm using double quotes because I have space in the, in the value. Um, so let's um, put this, uh, this query into the search within field. And I will get um, three valves. All of them are made of ca carbon steel. The uh, second query, I'm looking for ball material equal um, uh, asterisk steel, meaning that uh, I, I want to get all uh, valves that are made of something with a steel at the end, that the ball is made of uh, something with steel. So we get the cast steel, stainless steel, and also the carbon steel. And the third, um, here you, oops, sorry, You can see that uh, the temperature is set with a Celsius degree. This is the unit we choose to display uh, this attribute. But here in the query, I'm searching for minimum temperature bigger or equal to minus four Fahrenheit degrees. So uh, the system will take uh, and convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. And because minus four Fahrenheit degrees equal to minus 20 Celsius degree, you can see that I got only valves with minimum temperature bigger or equal to minus 20 Celsius degrees. The last example, I'm using the end uh, logical expression um, to have a more, we can use it also for a range. In this case, I'm using different attributes, but um, this is also supported. By the way, we don't need to, um, to be specific on the class to search in the class. We can be in any level. For example, here I'm standing on the valves class and searching for all valves below uh, uh, classified in any subclass uh, with a valve material equal to bronze. And I found few few results. Now I can use the six W tags to narrow down um, those results. So you can see that uh, I, I can see the uh, libraries and the different classes those uh, items are classified in. And if you remember the, um, the type of operation uh, attribute, we set for it a predicate. And this is exposed now in the 6W tag. So I can filter the, the results to show me only a hydraulic uh, operation. When I found my item, I can easily use it. For example, here I'm dragging and dropping it, it into the engineering release application to use it in my engineering definition. Uh, let's see the example in uh, here. It's in Katia, but it's available in any uh, native application. I'm opening the library browser from the tools menu. And you can see I, I'm having the same, uh, the, same, um, pretty, the same experience. I can select a valve from my list and insert it into, uh, into my CATIA session. What I can also do, I can search and, um, and um, select to replace an, an existing um, item with uh, one from the library. So now I'm selecting this classified item and I want to replace it with the existing one in the session. 
So this is done by right click on the classified item in the library browser. Same, um, same experience in, uh, in SOLIDWORKS. Um, here it is called IP Classify and Reuse. I can open the properties from SOLIDWORKS and uh, see all the classification attributes available with their values. And then I can also use the search if I want and easily drag and drop and use a classified item into my SOLIDWORKS session. Um, okay, we'll do that fast, so we'll have some time also for, for questions and answers. Um, so this is, this is for the uh, classification manager role. Now I, uh, I want to review with you a couple of uh, latest enhancements. Um, those are not all the enhancements made uh, in the latest F21X FTs, but some of them I already um, explained and used them during my session. Uh, so I choose uh, only those that, um, that I didn't uh, touch during the webinar. A um, few of them are relevant to transition from CATIA catalog um, to library. So the first one is uh, about the tree list view option. You saw, it, you saw me use it when I added the uh, thumbnail um, to, the, to the IP and classify uh, table. But this can also be used to add uh, additional out of the box and customized attributes to be displayed in the, um, in the, in the widget table, in the widget columns. Actually, it has nothing to do with classification attributes because classification attributes are um, um, by default displayed in the, in the table. Uh, it's similar um, to the same, the, same, the same concept you have in, uh, in other applications. The next uh, enhancement is about mapping component family and classification. Um, component families um, find in CATIA can now be published into libraries and classes. You have a, a dedicated dialogue for that um, in which uh, you can uh, map between the design table parameters that you can see here um, two classification attributes. This is done here at the bottom, um, at the bottom of the, the, the dialogue. And uh, the mapping applied to both resolved and unresolved part families. Um, and then you can, you can publish it and it will be uh, available in the library. Let's, uh, let's look uh, on, on this. Uh, first, I'm going to choose uh, the library and the class I would like to classify the resolved and unresolved component family. So here I'm choosing uh, an existing uh, grip transfer class below the mechanical components. And I'm mapping between the component family parameters and the classification attributes. Now I publish it. So it will be available now in library. Let's open CATIA to, to look. So I have here an assembly. By the way, um, look, the assembly already contains one grip transfer arm. And as, uh, as shown previously, from the tools menu, I can open the library browser. And I have here my grip transfer class, including all the component families items uh, with the, the attributes that were mapped from the um, design table. So I can select a different item. I can either use it, but in this case, I want to replace it with the existing grip that I have in my assembly. So very easily, I right click and replace it. Uh, this enhancement is about um, generating uh, libraries from catalogs, from CATIA catalog. In general, uh, this, is, uh, this is the sole strategy to move from catalogs to libraries. And um, for this, we have um, a dedicated, again, um, 
dialogue, generate new library structure available from the catalog. But this enhancement is mainly about um, that uh, in, in addition to the generate the library structure from the catalog, uh, we also um, um, generate the classification attributes and associate them to the relevant uh, classes. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, in the dialog first, you have the option to generate a keyword mapping XML, looks like that, including uh, the list of uh, keywords. And you can uh, manually map and uh, define here the appropriate classification attributes. And then you browse to this XML and the generate library. And this will create for you the library structure and link all classification attributes to the respective classes. But be aware, um, the classification attributes need to be created in advance. Um, this process does, doesn't create the classification attributes for you. So a quick view. Uh, here we have um, the CATIA catalog. Let's expand it. We have here a few chapters and classified um, items. We have two keywords uh, for this catalog. And I'll open the Generate New Library Structure dialog. And uh, generate the keyword mapping XML. It is generated, but before getting into the XML, I need to make sure that I have um, uh, the classification attributes already defined in, in the database. So here they are, I have them both. And now I will work on the XML and map between the um, keyword and the uh, relevant classification attribute. Now I'm going back to the dialog. I will point to this XML that I've just created and I will generate the library. I don't have here the results, but the result will have the library structure similar to the um, catalog um, structure, including um, the uh, classification attributes associated to the relevant classes and the uh, classified items. So thank you very much uh, for your time. And um, I hope you found uh, this webinar beneficial to you. Uh, I do think we have a few minutes for, um, for questions. So uh, Naeem, I will um, get back to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anna. That was really... Uh very good overview uh, going through the process, going through the different uh, capabilities and the values that these uh, capabilities allow the user, uh, the librarian or the person who's responsible to, uh, to benefit from. So uh, Matthew, you want to say something? No. So let's go through uh, the questions. There were a lot of questions here today. I'd like to thank uh, Sandrine that answered all these questions. Um, so let me read some of uh, these questions and we, with the answers and further on, later on, you will be able to answer, to, to continue asking uh, these questions in uh, this community. So let me take the first question. Uh, it seems there are two sets of apps for classification. One is the IP classification uh, and the other one is the IP classify in fact, IP classify and reuse and uh, classify and reuse. And what are the differences and what is the recommended one for uh, their usage? So the answer is that we have one app, which is the strategic app of DAS systems, which is the dashboard app that is called IP classify and reuse. This is what we recommend to use. The classify and reuse, it's an app which is coming from the legacy uh, web apps. And we don't recommend it to, to be used anymore. So please, if you have, uh, if you work with the IP classify and reuse, uh, you need to continue working with the new app, which is the strategic app that's available in the dashboard. And that's where everything is going to be developed and enhanced within this app. Uh, let's take another question. Um, 
can you assign and set uh, classification values during import, for example, using XPDM? So currently, this is not possible yet. Uh, there is a question here about uh, the tagging. So using tags is included in the base, but using classification allows much more flexibility for similar goals. Is this right? So the answer is yes, that is right, because the classification attributes will allow you to create more complex tagging by defining your own taxonomy with uh, as many classes as you want or as you need and as many attributes that you need in order to classify your IPs. Is it possible uh, a real attribute convert values from inches to meters, for example, typing the unit? Uh, so maybe I let uh, Sandrine, if you can give us the answer on this question. Yes, so in fact, uh... What you can do with classification attributes is the same as what you can do with global uh, attributes on the platform. So we, we have the same behavior. So today from the platform, this is not possible. But um, what is possible now is that if you uh, do not uh, set any specific unit during the creation of the attribute, when you use the library browser in the native session, you will be able to use new preferences to set a unit on each dimension. And in that case, uh, what you will see in the native session will be uh, your uh, classification attribute with a specific dimension that, uh, or unit that you set for this dimension. But on the, on the dashboard apps, so far, uh, we, we display units only in MKS units. And uh, we have some announcements, so stay tuned. OK, thank you. Uh, OK, so another question. Uh, is it possible to have a link between two different classification attributes? For example, one is in inches, another one is in millimeter. And when I change uh, one, then the other one will automatically be updated. So currently, this is not possible so far. Obviously, this is a quite interesting use case, but currently we are we cannot do this in the platform. Uh, let's see another question. Um, why do these headers, there was a question about some headers that appear. Um, why do these headers sometimes look fine, but other times they, uh, a long hex string is shown I have seen this behavior myself. Is there a recommendation, a recommended way to make sure that we get meaningful headers here in this case? So maybe Sandrine, if you can explain, uh, there seems to be uh, some limitation here. Yes, in fact, uh, mm. when you create or when you associate uh, classification attributes to a class using IP classification editor dashboard app, uh, in fact, we create some internal uh, group or name uh, that is displayed in the properties panel. This mm -hmm. is not correct uh, as uh, it's not user friendly, in fact. So what we want is to change that and it's coming soon. Uh, um, okay. mm -hmm. So we will display a more user friendly name and uh, group attributes in the properties panel and to display them correctly. Um, yeah. So yes, it's a kind of limitation so far, but uh, we want to change we'll, it. We'll improve it. Yes, yeah. we will improve it. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. All right. Good. Okay. So I think we can. Uh, we have taken uh, quite a good number of questions. So guys, keep asking the questions. We will continue answering. We will uh, look for uh, the best way to give you uh, answers uh, around again the classification manager or anything around this topic with the classification uh, management. And I think we can uh, stop here, uh, Matthew. OK, yes. Thank you uh, to our presenters. And thank you, everyone who attended today. See you around the community. Thank Bye you. Now. Have a good day. <laughs>